morning we're uh, continuing in our study in the letter that Paul wrote to the church of Philippi in the Philippians. We're getting really close to the end. Um, we're at the point now where, you know, I just give one dud of a sermon, we're done with Philipp Philippians. That's a... Uh, I'm just kidding. But the, we're really getting to the part where Paul is closing out his letter to the church. And a lot of times, um, I don't know about you, a lot of times when you get past really Paul's heavy theological sections and his, his great you know, theological statements, of which there are so many in the book of Philippians, right? You know, um, you know for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, you know. Um, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Just really great verses, really bedrock verses, right? And then we get to the end where he's kind of, you know, uh, giving some last instructions and he's going to finish with some greetings and we kind of like that, 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 you know, let's move on to Colossians, you know, and that's not, not exactly the way I think that we should read this book. Um, I think that closing letters is a little bit of a lost art today. I mean, most of you remember when we used to write letters, right? It was, you don't have to indicate that. I know who you are. Um, uh, you know, we used to close letters a certain way. You'd put some thought into it. You wouldn't just leave like a thought hanging out there. It's like, oh, I'll talk to you later. You know, you want to close it off. You want to sign off well, right? Um, today, I don't think that's paid attention to very much. I mean, even with here, um, you know, uh, even in our conversations, I could have a conversation with Jerry and we'd have really, you know, really talk about some great things and uh, we don't have to really sign off well because I can get in the car and text them right away, you know. Oh, by the way, Jerry, is this, right? We continue our conversations, not while I'm driving, no, but, you know, certainly. We don't have that urgency to say things a certain way because we won't have an opportunity to say them for another two months. You know, how long does it take for someone to walk a letter from Rome to Philippi, right? It's no FedEx, you know. So Paul's writing things that uh, he's writing things in a, in a way that's going to be lasting, that's going to be impactful. His closings are not just closings that are, you know, a whim off the top of his head. Oh, maybe he's, he's pretty brilliant and inspired, but he's going to put a lot of thought into this, so I want us to pay attention to it. We're go I'm going to read uh, Philippians chapter 4, starting with verse 14. I'll just read through the end of the chapter. Don't know, we'll get through all of it today, but um, this is the reading of the word. Again, Paul has just said that, uh, finished telling them that he is happy that they are renewing uh, their concern for him. Um, and that they are starting to support him again in his ministry, even though he's under house arrest. He says, don't worry. Um, I, have, uh, I can deal with any situation God gives me. I can do all things through Christ or through him who strengthens me. And he says in verse 14, yet... It was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians, yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. 
So this, uh, from uh, just the naked eye, so to speak, this is really concerning um, the issue of the Macedonians, which is the church in Philippi, which is in Macedonia, Macedonia, they are supporting Paul, right? They are giving him gifts, and he's very thankful. And he's saying, I, I'm thankful not because, you know, I'm seeking to get money from you guys and I really need it. I'm thankful because what he says, it is, it is a credit to your account, so to speak. So, you know, what does that mean, first of all? And then he says, I have received full payment and I am well supplied. And, and Epaphroditus brought all these things to me from you. He was the messenger from the church of Philippi to Paul. And that everything that you gave me was like a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So what does that mean? Um, and then this statement, and my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Um, it may read a little different uh, to, to, in some versions. Uh, it may read something to the effect, if I remember. And, and my God uh, will supply every need of yours according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. It just depends on how you translate the Greek. Like he's reading it wrong. Um, so what does all this mean? This is kind of some lofty talk. And it is addressing this idea of economy, right? This is really about economy. And one of the things that we should realize in Christianity is that we live basically in two different economies. We do. We live, of course, in the economy of the world where we have to pay bills and taxes and um, you know if we have a job we get paid or if our water heater breaks we pay out you know, we have that kind of economy going on prices rise prices fall our needs increase or decrease depending on what our financial situation is right i mean everyone knows that there is a second economy that we live in and that is the economy of the kingdom of God. And that economy does use as its resources the economy of this world. And yet we are given this idea of, of the Macedonians who are, from what I read in commentaries, not the richest church around, not the biggest church around. But they're supporting Paul when other churches haven't at this point in his ministry. I'll give you some context on this. Uh, you're familiar with the letter in the New Testament, to a couple letters to the Thessalonians, right? Thessalonica. It's one of the earlier churches that Paul you know, established. And he wrote to them, you could read this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, um, I'll, I'll read it to you. He's writing to the church in Thessalonica. And he says, uh, I'm using a new Bible this morning. Because I uh, was reading mine in a different place at home last night. And so I left it there. So when I picked up my stack of stuff, my Bible wasn't there. But I figured I was going to a pretty good place that might have some there for me. Um, but this print's kind of small. Um, he's writing to the church uh, in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians. In verse uh, 6, you Thessalonica, Thessalonica, Thessalonians, <laughs> you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only is the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia, the Philippians, and Achaia, the Galatians, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. So he's giving, he's giving this, this great testimony of the great faith of Thessalonica so that even uh, in regions of 
where Philippi is and the regions of the Galatians, where the Galatian church is, they're hearing about this great faith of Thessalonians. Then Paul's established a church in Corinth, right? A very much more rich church, a very eclectic church, maybe a much bigger church, but they had a lot of kind of things going on. Um, and Paul would minister to them, and they were a church with great resources. But Paul, in his second, uh, the second letter we have from him, is writing to them, and he is talking about his service to them. This kind of, you know, what I picture is a, a, a pretty a church filled with people that have pretty deep pockets, a pretty large income, wealth, a lot of wealthy people. And he writes them in chapter eleven, uh, verse eight. He says. Um, Look, I, I preached the gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches, it's metaphorically speaking, um, by accepting support from them in order to serve you, O rich church. And when I was with you and I was in need, I did not burden anyone for who the brothers who came from Macedonia, the Philippians, supplied my need. So I refrained from burdening you in any way. So we have these churches in Thessalonica has this great faith. We have the church of Corinth with great wealth. And who are the ones who are supplying Paul with his needs? The church of Philippi. Not the Thessalonians. It says in, in verse 16, even when I was in Thessalonica, this church of great faith, you sent me help for my needs once and again or over and over so we have this economy in which the Philippians are using their resources in order to supply Paul and in fact to help build the kingdom this is what Paul said at the beginning of the letter when he said I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the day from one, from day one until now. So this is what the letter is about. And if you want to, this is kind of a little bit of a summary here because it's all in this paragraph. There are certain things which keep, Paul keeps mentioning over and over in this letter. And one of those um, is fellowship, partnering. Um, you see this in, in our text this morning, verse 15. Uh, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving. That's the word that some of you who have some Greek knowledge, koinonia, of fellowship, right? That's that word, it's that base word. But earlier, he says in verse 14, it was kind of you to share my trouble. Same root, same word. It means coming alongside and being equally vested in something. So that wasn't just Paul's ministry. It was Paul and the Philippians' ministry. They, they were on board. They were on the team. And this is... Um, over and over is mentioned throughout the letter, this idea of we as Christians are not just called to be people who have our own separate, wonderful relationship with Jesus and we don't share with anyone else. In fact, uh, we are to be not only invested in one another, but invested in what God is doing. Okay. The second idea that we see a lot of is uh, from the Greek word phronein. It is to have a, a a similar mindset, to have a similar perspective, or literally to be facing the same direction, right? So that uh, when he says in chapter 2, you all need to have this kind of mindset, which was also in Christ Jesus, that even though he was in the form of God, he didn't consider that as something to be grasped, to be equal with God, but he humbled himself coming in the form of a servant. And he tells them over and over that your focus, your mindset should be not for your own benefit, but for one another. 
because Jesus has had that mindset for us, for the work he's doing for his kingdom. When you talk about the kingdom of God, it's not like the kingdom of Disneyland, you know, where you picture this little castle when you walk in, right? Oh, this is, you know, the, what do they call it? The magic kingdom. Right? Not that. Not where it's identifiable by this castle. And you go, the kingdom of God is us. Okay. It is, it is the church now and yet to come. Okay. The third th- phrase that we see over and over and over is from the Greek word uh, dunamai, which is a, the verb, or um, it, it means uh, power, you know, like dynamic, like dynamite, like boom, you know, something that energizes you, right? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's where the word comes from. And we see this over and over in the text here. And the reason why is because there is a certain person who is central to all of our lives, to all of the history of the world. That person is Jesus, the Son of God. He says in here that that Paul himself, he wants to know Jesus. He wants to, to know him and the What? Power, same word, of his resurrection. He says that we are citizens of heaven and we await a Savior who will transform our lowly bodies, talking about the kingdom come, the kingdom that will come. We are waiting for him to come who will transform our lowly body in the resurrection to be like his glorious body by the, what, power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. All things. He's in charge of all things. He's given all things. We make a mistake in this world of saying that the next generation is going to be the inheritors, you know, of the next world, you know. We picture it that way. We live for a while, we pass it on to the next generation, right? That is wrong. We are at best benefactors of the one person who inherits this world. It was bought on the cross and it was verified stamped authentic by the resurrection that is why it says in the book of revelation chapter 11 15 the kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our lord and of his christ and he will reign say it forever So we have the crossover of the economy, of the economy now of this world, yet there is a Savior who is present, who is alive, who is the one who will inherit and has already has the rights to this world, whose economy is not based on the riches of this world, but the riches of his glory. So when Paul says, Look, I've, trust me, I've received full payment, everything I need. And even more so, I am well supplied from your gifts to me. He's talking to economies here. And what you give is a fragrant offering to God. Now this is Old Testament talk. That's kind of, remember the sacrifices, you know, the... It's the idea of the smoke rising up and pleasing uh, God up in heavens. It's a metaphor. It's a picture. Uh, the Hebrew language uses a word that, that describes this as if we're envisioning God in the heavens and, and the smoke from the sacrifices then uh, rise up to him. Revelation uses this idea too. It's a kind of Greek word based on the Hebrew word when 
when the destruction of those who are against Jesus are cast into the lake and the smoke rises from their destruction, that is a smoke that is pleasing to God. Um, Paul says, look, this is the, the same way. Your giving, your giving to me is great. I can use it, but I don't have, the, I don't have needs that, that I'll, I'll be desperate without it. Instead, what this means, I'm happy that you gave it because you are doing the fellowship. You are saying in this that you are joining with me who has joined with the Lord Jesus, i.e. you are joining in the Lord's work to build the kingdom. And he will supply every need of yours. He's not talking of the just about the age to come. He's talking about as you live now, he will supply every need of yours. Now this is where a lot of times kind of branches off of things that are called Christianity um, error. It's the idea of, well, if I give to the church, I can expect a nice, nice check in the mail from some anonymous source or, you know, I'll get, uh, everything will start going my way. That's not what he's talking about. That's not your needs. That's your earthly, fleshly desires. God is not an automatic slot machine that you put money in and you get a little jackpot. What he's talking about is that from the glory of the one who, in, who is Lord of the earth now and inherits the earth to come. The only one, by the way, who has a resurrected body ready for that age. Right? He's the firstborn of the dead. We're not there yet. We're awaiting him to come and to make that happen for us. Right? And when that does, think about it, the economy is not based upon world markets anymore, not based upon, you know, what country is or is not shipping oil or, or any other kind of war that might be going on. The economy is based on the riches of glory in Christ. And what Paul is saying is like, if you think that his glory in heaven is separated from the worldly economy and what he can or cannot do for your needs, you are wrong. He will provide for every need of yours. I'm sure of that. Because he is doing so according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This is why Paul says earlier in chapter 3, I want to know the power of his resurrection. He's not just saying, I want to know how to be resurrected. I want to know what it's like to live in this life and be supplied by not only a great man who is the son of God on earth, but one who has died and has been raised in glory and is now dealing with his children from that position. Kind of a heavy thing if you think about it. We, I believe, and I say this because we're human, and I'm with you on this, so <laughs> we drastically underestimate the power of Jesus' resurrection. It is not only that he conquered death, but that's a pretty big one, too. I mean, it is not only that he continues to live and that he has ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty big too. Um, but it also means that we are ministered to, called, befriended, loved by one who is resurrected and operates in the glory of the kingdom to come. 
even though we're in this age now. If we truly believe that, how can we believe that he will not supply every need of ours in the time that we need it? Now, he doesn't use our wish list for that. He allows us to go through some pretty tough times, to suffer through things. And every one of those moments, without exception to those who are his, he promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I will get you to where you need to go. Everything you need is provided by him. How's that song about his great faithfulness? All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, unto me. My hope for us, for you, for me, is that um, while we deal with the realities of the economy of this world, I mean, it's a reality, while we deal with the reality of of struggling through trying to budget or trying to make sense of the world, even not even monetary stuff, just the life. That we understand it not only just in what we see in this world, but we do so with the mindset of the children of God who have a, who have a Savior who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who has been raised from the dead, And by that resurrection brings glory to the Father out of which we are given all that we need. Now, not just then. And the goal of, of Paul bringing this up to them all is just to say, look, you have been faithful, not just in believing in Jesus, but joining in the fellowship of the gospel. You are a part of the fellowship of what God the Father, what Jesus and the Holy Spirit, through the disciples, through the apostles, of which Paul is talking through us, building the kingdom, sharing Jesus, sharing the word of Christ with those who need him so much that you are with us, you are in fellowship with all of us. And you've proven it by sending people who are able to come and minister to me, Paul, in prison. You have demonstrated by supporting us when vast amounts of other Christian churches who had resources didn't do it. And when he says, it accrues to your account, it's just his way of saying, you better believe that God pays attention to that. You better believe that. So I pray for two things for us. One, um, that we um, receive this with the fourth theme of this book, with great joy, that we rejoice in the Lord always, knowing that this is ours. And we can praise him, even though we face something like, Lord, around that corner, whether that is an illness or whatever it is, I don't know what's there, but I know you are there and I know that you are going to supply my every need. So I receive that with joy, Lord. And the second is that we consider how we are participating in the gospel. And not everyone is, is, you know, ready to get up and, you know, go with Melanie overseas, right? Um, not everyone is, is, is suited to, to do teaching or evangelism. Not everyone is suited to do a plethora of things, but we are all suited 
to do something in the ministry of the gospel. He wasn't even talking about, hey, you Philippians, you need to kind of develop some teachers. And He's saying, look, you have supported me in, in what we're doing. You have been giving of, of your temporal wealth for the sake of an eternal kingdom. And we need to pay attention to that. God loves you so much. Faithful love. Jesus loved you with the love that took him to the cross for you. It's not a question of their love for us. They're not saying, ah, now if you send in five bucks, and I'll really love you more. He has demonstrated that love for us. And it is our desire to express love to him. Not only just worship and prayer and, and singing, which is so important. Um, but in taking that relationship, which is in the eternal, and displaying it in the present, in this world. That's another sermon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, first and foremost, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Yes. Thank you for looking upon me and my brothers and sisters who were lost, who were rebellious, who were not worthy of you. And loving us and calling us and paying our debt. Lord, I pray that we are always in wonder of the resurrection of Jesus. And I pray that it is that power that fuels us not only to face today and tomorrow but to do so with the mindset that we are here not for ourselves, but for the kingdom, which includes our brothers and sisters in front of us, behind us, to the left and right, that we might, with the Philippians, and with Paul and all the evangelists, um, share in the fellowship of the glory of the gospel of Jesus, that that might be our testimony, our faith, not only in the now, but in the age to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.